We are continuing, yes, Revelation part 1,223, as Zach uh, made a slate at, and so, but we're actually going to start to speed up our Revelation series, and we're moving forward, and we're going to be looking now at major themes and sections of Scripture and Revelation as we continue to, to move through this book. Why I was so slow at the beginning uh, to answer the question, uh, we wanted to set the framework from the book to encourage the church to be active and moving forward, really to get us realizing that this book is for us currently, not to brush it over. And so today we're going to look at chapter four. We're going to head right into it. And as you read chapter four and five, these next two chapters, you're going to realize they go together. Obviously, you realize Revelation all goes together. It's one big vision that was given to John by Jesus. Uh, But chapter four and five are a vision uh, of heaven that John gets. And so we hear Now we hear at the beginning of chapter 4 and 5, we see that there's a throne and a lamb, and we're like, what does this mean as we enter into this? Now, as a person that wears glasses, uh, I have the best, a weird, weird thing to say, but I have the benefit of remembering why I need glasses. Uh, I can remember sitting in the back of math class very vividly, and it was a very long classroom, uh, and I was all the way at the back, and I can remember looking at the chalkboard and just being like, I can see it if I squint. And so, but just thinking that, that that's just the normal thing, right? You're, I'm like, I'm pretty far away, so I should just squint and be able to see. Like, nobody else can see back here. And so, uh, and then eventually I had a doctor's appointment, uh, and behold, I need glasses. And so, and I'm nearsighted, I believe, because I can't see far away. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Any ophthalmologist in the building, you know, I, let me know if that's right. Uh, but I put my new glasses on, and I was like, it changed everything. Perspective changed completely. You know, I could read signs. I could drive safely. You know, it's a, I can make out who was my parent and not my parent. And so um, the fact of the matter is every human being, though, wears a set of glasses. Uh, these glasses, you know, are not given to us by ophthalmologists. But they're given to us by our parents, our extended family, by our childhood experiences, by our teachers, by our culture that we grew up in, that are surrounded by us. And they are shaped by relationships, uh, by books we read, by films we see, by songs that we sing, and by the joys and sorrows that we all experience through life. These glasses that we wear, they shape our view of everything that we see. Now, here's the practical and critical point to grasp with this. The set of glasses we wear, our frame of reference, our perception of reality, determines the dimensions of our world and the quality of our lives. And the question then becomes, is my perception of reality accurate? Does my frame of reference square up with the things that actually really are, that are happening around me? Do my glasses focus on reality or do they distort reality? And we're going to put, you know, the glasses on of Revelation 4 and 5 these next two weeks. Together they constitute our vision of heaven that make our vision actually of earth. So we have to have this vision of heaven. Now, most everyone, right, knows the Lord's Prayer. Some, we have even sung the Lord's Prayer, you know, in school, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We went through this series right at the beginning of the year where we really dove into each and every one of these small sections of the prayer. The section on earth as it is in heaven, note the word as is means currently. Currently, you're like, well, this is heaven. I'm like, don't sign me up. But the reality is this, that heaven is actually, it's a, it's a present reality that we have to realize is not yet to be created. It is a reality. And we think heaven's this future reality that isn't presently active. But heaven is a present reality, not just a future hope. Listen, I very much believe that it is a future hope, that once my time here is over on earth, that I will be in heaven, and that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Yes, I very much agree with it. But heaven just wasn't just going to be magically created. When we have passed away, it is a reality that we have to realize that is active. It's active. And John gives us this picture as we read Revelation 4 and 5. He is standing on the island of Patmos, and he is looking out from this island, and he gets a vision. And it says, After this I looked, and there before, my, before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. 
So on a certain Lord's day, he was sitting on a rock pile. Uh, that is, he was here on earth. And here on earth, he saw a door open, standing open in heaven. The point being that John, he was not transported to another place or time to see what he sees. For John, heaven refers to another dimension of reality that is right here. It's actually close at hand. This is what Revelation is talking about, that it's close, that Jesus is close, that it is a reality amongst us, all around us, intersecting with the visible, tangible dimensions that we currently live in. Now, New Testament scholar George Carey, he puts it this way, heaven is a part of the universe, but a part which is entered by the opening of the spiritual eye rather than the external form of transit, like we you know, us driving from here to the church this morning. So while standing on this rock pile, on Patmos, Jesus Christ, he pulls back the curtain. He opens the door and he gives John a picture to help him understand what is going on right now actually in another dimension? This is not like, you know, we're in Marvel people out there, you know, you're thinking about the multiverse and stuff like that. This is not it. Um, but it's like radio waves. It intersects and pervades the dimension. Now, if this is so, then those who are heavenly minded are not of no earthly good. When we are heavenly minded, we are very much needed what's here on earth. They are of the most earthly good. When we have a picture of heaven, we have the reality of heaven that we hold on to, that we grasp to, that we see that is very much present with us. Obviously, it's not the final reality because there will be new heavens, new earth. We'll be with Jesus forever. Because right now, though, you see the whole picture. You get it. Things are not what they seem like. There's actually more. The two most used common uh, commands in Revelation are look and do not fear. Now, have you ever been driving on the road? And then you look to your left as you're driving. Or maybe you look to the back of your kid to see your kids, right? Because you're trying to like, see where you can tell them to stop and doing whatever they're doing. What usually happens is that your eyes lead you to, or your, your direction where you're going is led by your eyes, Right? You're looking at the beautiful mountains and you're realizing the mountains are getting a little bit closer. <laughs> I tell this story. It is an amazing story, an embarrassing story of myself. Last year, we were in Mexico. Uh, and so where we were staying at, there was a pool in the common area. And so I was chilling, having a good time, relaxing, you know what, working on my sunburn. And then I got up and I was like, I should put on some, you know what, some lotion. And so I'm walking to the room. And as I'm walking to the room, I swear I heard Kim talk to me. And so I like look back to see what she was saying. And so I'm looking, it's like, oh, she's not talking. And as I'm making my steps, I realize there's not another step in front of me. And so I look down and here I am entering into the pool. <laughs> and so I walk right into the pool. And I you know I tried to do the thing where you don't want to fall into the pool. So you essentially just start running along the side, just prolonging the inevitable and making everybody have more time to see what's about to happen. And I just run along the side, fall into the pool, sandal breaks, I hurt my toe. And it's just like the saddest day ever. And so, but where I'm focusing on it leads me, right? Where my eyes are pointed to is where it's going to lead me to where I'm going. You see, what we regularly look at determines our direction. We look at the world, and then there tends to be fear. If we're keeping our eyes on everything that the world has to offer, everything that's happening within our world, listen, fear will come against you. It will. But Jesus is giving John a different world view. He's giving him a different view. He's saying, look at heaven, look at the throne, look at what is happening here, and your fear will reduce. Jesus is giving John a reality that heaven is present. It's a present reality, and it currently exists, and it exists in this reality of life. Look, a throne, not, hey, way out there, not way up there. It's close at hand, so very close, right? John's on the island, and it simply, it just pulls back the veil, and he gets this picture of heaven. That's close. We cannot see it with the unaided eye. We may not be able to see it with a set of glasses given to us by our parents, our school, or our culture. But we have to put on the Revelation 4 glasses and look 
Do you see the throne? Do you have a perception of heaven? Are you keeping your eyes on him? It is the most dominant image of Revelation. John refers to it 47 times, and he uses other related terms 77 times. Look, says John, a throne. Look, he's calling us to look. He's calling us to have eyes that focus on him. That is why it is told to spend time with Christ, to focus on him. Listen, it's not a feel-good answer that we just tell you, now that you're a Christian, this is what you have to do. This is what, you know, at the rules of being a Christian. No, it's because we know when we focus on Jesus, when you focus your eyes upon him, it changes your perception of everything that's happening within your life. It helps you. It leads you. It guides you. He speaks to you. He fills you. It gives you direction. And then you begin to be led by him. And you have everything around this world that feels like it's falling apart. You feel a little bit more safer because you have eyes on Christ. This month has been actually very hard for me and my family. Uh, and so last Sunday it was beautiful because it helped us look and get past the noise of all of life around us. Just all life around us. And it was beautiful because we just simply had to focus on him, on heaven, on the reality of following Jesus. We need to look at the throne, right? If you hike up Spy on Coop, and as you're going up there, right, what are you looking for? You're looking for that cell tower, you know, and you're thinking, like, I should get the best cell service. And so that maybe leads you to, wow, my 5G is really fast, you know, and so I'm on the right path. And so you're looking, you're, we need to find something to focus on to get where we're going, right? So what are you gazing upon is the question. What are you gazing upon? Answering that question, we'll find, that's where you'll find your peace. There is so much that stands out about the throne. John is struck by what is on the throne, what comes around the throne, what's behind the throne, what's under the throne, what's everywhere around the throne. The simplest vision John can get is God is on the throne. He's on the throne. So the veil is torn back. There's a throne. Someone's on the throne. And John, right, he's surrounded by complete chaos. And we go through our life, we feel like it's surrounded by complete chaos. Listen, the government was becoming more and more corrupt and increasingly hostile towards the disciples of Jesus at this time. Right, Nero, he began crucifying Christians, uh, feeding them to lions, like Domitian. He was, had a reign of terror. Over 40,000 Christians killed. Peter and Paul, you know, pillars of the faith were crucified. But good news, the throne of the universe is occupied, is what he's sharing to him. The throne of the universe is occupied. It's not up for grabs. Again, with our ordinary glasses, we conclude otherwise. If we're looking through this perception of our world, we think it's in complete chaos. Who's in control? And it often feels like the headquarters is vacant. It often feels like there's no one in control. And there's this great quote, quote by Corey Ten Boom. She says this, There is no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. What an amazing quote. There is no panic in heaven. God has only, no problems, only plans. Listen, things come and go. Things within our world, right? You know, movements, they, they happen. They cease. But what we've realized is that they cease to exist, right? Things that have come and gone. My hair, it has come and gone. And so it is no longer to be seen. We get small remnants of my hair at my house. And so we have to decide, is it the dog's hair or is it Jeremy's hair? And so, um, but things come and go. Things don't last. Movements, Nazism, fascism, anarchism, Zionism. It's not about my son. The American Revolution, right? We thought America is going to be the biggest, most powerful country forever and ever and ever. Listen, that's come and gone too. Industrial Revolution, right? Come and gone. What's the movement from your generation that you can think of? What's the things that were happening in your life that have come and they've gone? Everything changes. Everything changes here. Our young generation, our young people who are sitting in this service or with Chris right now, what is relevant to you now will be irrelevant in 20 years, except clothes. That's the only thing that I can figure that continues to come back 20 years later. And so I look at some of the things that my wife wears. I'm like, wow, that was what we were 20 years ago. And so, but it's cool now. And the kids are like, you used to wear this? I'm like, yeah, we did. And they're like, wow. I should go, do you still have some of this close? Like, but the thought, the cultural revolution of your day, it will change. But there is one on the throne who always has been there. 
And this is what it says about him. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne was 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of those seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God, also in front of the throne. There was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So this is what it ex- describes the one who is on the throne. This is some of the words that are given to the one who's on the throne. It says, like jasper. And so jasper is this translucent stone, like glass, revealing and yet concealing. And so the imagery suggests beauty and majesty and radiance. And so when, depending on how the light shines and what from range it's coming, right, the colors could be yellow to green to red. It's this beautiful, just majestic image of how he looks. The one who sits on the throne is this lovely, dazzling, beyond description person. The living creatures call him the Lord God Almighty. Almighty is you know, a word that's really thrown around in the midst of our day. But in the Greek word, it's pantokratos. And it's the favorite, John's favorite word to use of God, that he is almighty, almighty, almighty. The one who sits on the throne has all might and all power and strength. And is therefore, in the words of Esther Ng of Hong Kong, not a victim of circumstance nor of human manipulation. He cannot be manipulated. He's not a victim of the circumstances that happen. He's trying to adjust. He is a God who is almighty. The things about God on this throne is everything around it recognizes its power and majesty. Our God reigns is the way the prophets put it. Our Father, right, who art in heaven, is the way Jesus puts it. It does not mean our Father who art far away, remote and distant, but our Father who art in the throne close at hand. The living God is so secure. And this is what we'll see throughout Revelation. He is so secure. He is so confident. He is so calm that every vision of God through Revelation, he's sitting. Listen, he's not lazy, but he's sitting confidently on the throne. He's not, oh, something happened, and he's like scrambling and panicking. Like, you know, sometimes like him and I find ourselves doing on some Sunday mornings, or even like any day we're going to school ready for kids, we find ourselves scrambling, trying to find things and whatnot. Listen, the God, he sits, he's confident. He's not moved by the circumstances. Not once in the book of Revelation are we told that God stands. When orders are given from the throne, we do not even see a movement of his hand. The command comes by his voice alone, someone on the throne, pulsating with brilliance, light, life, and glory, infinite calm and absolute power. He's a confident, calm God, and that should make us excited because we can trust him. He's calm. He's relaxed. Everything is just feels like his presence brings us this clarity in the midst of this chaos. Now, what happens from the throne? What happens from this throne? There is so much happening around from behind this throne. Let's look at it real quick. We're just going to go through these. There's flashes of lightning. Now, this language brings us back to Mount Sinai, thousands of years before when Moses was called up the mountain by God. And in Exodus 19, 16 to 19, it says this, there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud and a very loud trumpet sound. And the mountain was an all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the whole mountain quaked violently. Now, when you trace all that imagery throughout the Bible, you learn that it is a way of declaring how awesome and powerful and how holy God is when you hear about the thunder and the lightning. And this goes with the seven bulls, the seven trumpets, and the seven seals. You know what? We hear those, and we're like, what are the seven bulls? What are the seven trumpets? What bull are we in? Like, what's happening? Or, you know, how many trumpets are we into? Listen, great. And as we move th- through those things, and we talk about those a little bit more, we'll, we'll dissect them a bit. But all seven show this. All seven show perfection. But they all describe as coming with thunder and lightning, all those things. The trumpets, the bulls, the seals. Which means we are looking 
at someone who is powerful that we must listen to. That's what that means. Somebody is powerful, someone we must listen to. Now, behind the throne, there was this rainbow. Now, the rainbow is there for right. We've heard the story, the ark, the symbol of God's mercy and faithfulness. The rainbow declares that the Holy One welcomes the us, that it's safe to come to him. You can come to me. The rainbow declares that we can trust the living one. His judgments are merciful and his mercy is just. The rainbow declares that we can dare to dream of a new creation. For the one who promises keeps his promises. That's who he is. That's what he does. Now around this throne, there is this sea of glass. From the rest of the book, as you will continue through Revelation, we discover that for John, the sea represents everything that opposes the will of God everything that is opposed and against him. The sea represents all those who seek to overcome, undo, to destroy the work of God. So the myth widespread during this time, in John's time, the original act of creation involved God in a desperate but finally victorious uh, contest with the forces of chaos and evil, which were identified with, or at any rate, located in the waters of sea. So was, this creation was done against the waters of the sea. But people of John's day, they feared the sea, right? They didn't have cruises, right? They didn't have that we had now. For it represented the forces of chaos that are always trying to suck orderly cosmos back into the void. So he says, look, a throne. And before it, what looked like a sea smooth as glass, clear as crystal. So what John is saying to the first readers and to us He's saying, you need to know this, that chaos will not win. Before the throne, chaos is stilled. Chaos is subdued. You've ever watched those fishing shows, right? The Great Catch. We see just like the, the, the amazing power of the sea and those vessels are being tossed and turned and whatnot. And we feel like, whoa, the sea is unbelievable. It is wild. And I remember one time, led a missions trip to Scotland. And you know, the guys, they wanted to jump off a pier into the North Sea. And so I did it. And I'll tell you this, it was cold in, it was cold out, it was never again. But I remember hitting the water and then like opening my eyes when I was in the water. And it was, it was trippy. I could see so much and there was, it felt like nothing around me. Just this void. What is amazing is that the sea, even in this picture, is tamed. That chaos is even in the presence. God is saying that the chaos is tamed in my presence. What are we being told is that even chaos has a purpose in the midst of everything. Even the forces ranged against God will be subdued. Even everything that's happening right now that feels like it's against God, it will be subdued. Now think about the chaos in your life. Think about those situations in your life where it feel, felt painful, where it felt like, what are you doing in the midst of this, God? Why is this happening? But then you look back and you see, God, you're doing something. There's beauty that you turned from what seemed like ashes. That scripture reminds us that he can take anything that feels unorderly, chaotic, and painful, and he can turn it to something good. We all know the reality of chaos, how often circumstances threaten to undo us, how often the pressures come so overwhelming that we feel as though the waves, they're just crashing on us. How often are our emotions churned by this? Inside, we feel like we're splitting apart. But look, look, a throne with someone sitting on it. And before the throne, a sea smooth as glass, clear as crystal, tamed. And we think about the story of Peter on the water and the chaos of the storm everything that was happening on that boat. And we can say like the psalmist, O oh Lord, Yahweh, who is like you? O oh mighty Lord, you rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. And we know that chaos does not win. Chaos will not win. What is really exciting is that when John gives a vision of a new creation, the first thing we notice is that the sea is actually gone. 
And it says this in Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. So sorry for those of you who love the ocean. Um, get in your ocean fix right now as you are still here on earth. Uh, go to the lake today, whatever you need to do. But there is a vision that there is no longer any sea. Because it means chaos. There's no longer any more chaos. One more thing I want to share about the throne. Um, right there's some numbers and some imagery that we see throughout Revelation that you know what, we all want to dissect and we all want to talk about. And I'm going to talk about them a little bit, but the main thing is about what these individuals attached to these numbers do. Now, 24 elders, why the number 24? Those you know, steeped in secular Roman worldview would think of the bodyguards that always surrounded the emperor. They would always think 24, there was always 24 bodyguards that surrounded the emperor at that time. So Domitian in, in particular, he had, he had 24 bodyguards. Kings in that time had 12, you know, councils had 12 bodyguards, emperors had 24. Furthermore, when Domitian presided at the games, he would be flanked by priests who were wearing crowns of gold, is what it would say. So is John playing off that background? What's he doing here? What's happening? Are the 24 elders the bodyguards of the Almighty, right? Because if he's Almighty, why does he have to travel around like a celebrity? Like, what, what, like what's going on? The number 24 is more likely suggested by 12 plus 12, which is basic math. I know I just said right there. And so you're like, wow, Jeremy, you can count yeah, some days. And so, uh, but, but it most likely represented the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus. So it follows that the 24 elders then represent the redeemed people of God, 12 representing the church before the coming of Christ, 12 representing the church after the coming of Christ. Both have been bought by the blood of the Lamb, which is made clear in Revelation as we go through. Now, some say they're angels, but the description of what these 24 are wearing normally describe individuals, what individuals are wearing, not angels. And we talk here about angels. You know what? Angels sound magnificent, but they also sound scary. And so, like, all their eyes and everything and how many wings they have. But anyways, and it says, it talks about the living creatures. Now, this is a bit harder to interpret, but the beauty is when we get to heaven, uh, you're going to be so enamored with Jesus, and you're not going to look back and scream, Jeremy, you are wrong. Like, that's my hope. And so, um, you're going to get to heaven, you're going to be like, oh, Jesus. And you're not going to be like, Jeremy, uh-huh. Yeah. And so, but... John sees four living creatures. Four is the number of creation. Four corners of the earth. Four winds. Uh, so there are four living creatures. The four living creatures most likely represent the whole animate creation made by God for God. So that's what it most likely represents. But here is what I want to close on. Here is what I want to wrap up. Here is what I want to leave you with. What are the elders and the living creatures doing around this throne? This is what it says. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. So this is what's happening. And this is what I really feel like he's calling us to. They are worshiping. They are worshiping the one who sits on the throne. Day and night, the living creatures never stop saying over and over and over again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. See, when we go to worship, we are entering into a service that's already in progress. Listen, worship doesn't begin and end, you know, it's with us. And when we say it starts, uh, when we gather to worship, we are stepping into a worship service that has been going on for a very, 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 very long time. We are entering into something that's already been happening, that's currently happening right now. And even as we leave this service and we go home, we'll still continue to happen. 
So John tells us that whenever the living creatures give glory to the one who sits on the throne, the 24 elders, they fall down on their face and they say, hey, listen, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. They begin to worship him. They fall at their feet. They lay everything down at the feet of God. They cry worthy. And worthy does not come from the religious world, actually. It comes from the secular world from the, actually the political realm. So worthy is what was shouted by citizens to the emperor when he entered a city. Worthy is what was shouted by the Roman senators as the emperor entered the great hall. They would all shout, worthy are you. The 24 elders and the four living creatures actually know who deserves those shouts. And they're saying, worthy, worthy, worthy is this guy. And they know why. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The 24 elders, they know and that the emperor owes every beat of their heart to. They know, Jesus, you owe, we owe everything of our hearts to you and every breath in our lungs to you. No one else is worthy because no one else created us. No one else sustains us. So this heavenly vision puts us in our place and calls us to our highest vocation. And this is our highest vocation. The Westminster Catechism asks the question, what is the chief end of humanity? And it was answer is this, the chief end of humanity is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But listen, we can do that right now and every bit of our life can be pointed towards him. But we need to have a vision and a reality that there is a king on the throne. We have to think about heaven, that it's not a distant, far away, you know, I can't wait till this time here on earth is done so I can get there. Heaven is present, it's close, and we need to tap into it. Looking through the lenses of Revelation 4, we realize that the great end of life is knowing and loving and serving and enjoying the great king. Listen, the longer that we wear these glasses of Revelation 4, the more we realize how appropriate it is the elders come off of their thrones and they say, hey, we're casting everything at your feet because you are the center of everything. They take all that they are and all that they have and they have everything that they've achieved and they lay it down before the throne in the center. And listen, the call for every aspect of our lives is to show we worship the king. Everything that we do, every aspect of our life, everything that we do should be a sign of worship unto our king, a sign of recognizing who is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, God of all gods. When we worship, our perception changes. Listen, as you came here today and as you begin to sing and as you begin to focus on him, did you feel something? Did something change? You feel lighter. When you spend time with Christ, you know what? You feel like, oh, my reality is changing. Things are looking different. I needed to be with him. People with worship, who worship with their lips and hearts, with their minds and bodies, people who worship with their words and deeds, people who surrender everything to the one who sits on the throne, something changes about our perception. And this vision teaches us that the surest way to gain or regain an accurate vision is to worship. Worship team, I'll call you up and you can just begin to just play softly as I just close with this. There is a response in the midst of this vision. Yes, we have to have a vision of heaven. We have to realize this. I know we all want to get there one day, but it is close by. John, it, the veil is pulled back by Jesus to show him heaven is a close reality. Heaven is a present reality. It's not something that will be created once we have passed away. That is very, very present. And it's calling us to focus on him, to focus on the king, to focus on the throne, to recognize he reigns and that we are then to do this, to worship the one who reigns, to put on the glasses of Revelation 4, to have a vision of heaven, to recognize what it means for us. So why don't you stand with me? The question I want to leave you today with is what is God saying to you? What are you saying to you? What is he calling you to? 
And how will you respond? How will you respond to what he's calling and saying to you? He is calling us to worship in everything that we do, to, to have our perception focused on him, to focus on the king, to focus on the one who loves, to focus on the one who sustains, to focus on the one who leads, to focus on the one who guides us. And when we do that, listen, realities begin to change here on what's happening on earth. But in the other side is, is that we begin to bring that reality here to earth. We are meant to be a vision of what Jesus is to others, to those around us, so that they know that there's something better, that they know that there's something more than what's here on earth. So as you enter into this week, and listen, I know I talked about worship, and I encourage you, of course, to engage in worship as we close, as we sing this song, and to focus on Him. But the challenge is once we leave here, once we go into our homes, we take off the, the glasses and put on the, you know, the worldview glasses, seeing everything that's happening within our world, or we keep the glasses of heaven on, recognizing he wants to do good work here, recognizing that it's rea reality is close to us, recognizing that we need to continue to focus on him. So let's engage this week, not just in these next five minutes in worshiping our king, but let's engage this whole week the perception of Jesus. Father, Lord, we thank you that you are here and you are close. Lord, that as we focus on you, Lord, as we've heard stories, Lord, as we even currently in our current world, in our life, as we move our eyes, we recognize that it begins to, to lead us and dictate us, whether it be driving or walking. So, Lord, you call us to put on the glasses of Revelation 4, to have this vision of heaven, to recognize that, yes, it is a future hope, but it's also a present reality. Because you're on the throne and you reign. And that chaos will not. So, Lord, I pray that you lead and guide us. Lord, I pray that as we go through this week, that we will focus and worship you, Jesus. Lord, because that changes our, our hearts, our minds. It changes the way we speak. It changes the way we live. It changes our actions, Lord. It changes everything about us. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. In your name.